Um, so let's take a look at the um, a pasuk in the book of Shir Hashirim. The book of Shir Hashirim, which is obviously so heavy with deep allegory, says the following: Anado diva marli kumilach rayati afatiul chilach. There's also beautiful music point to this. My beloved spoke thus to me: Arise, my darling. Oh, sorry. Let me just make sure I have this here. Sorry. Um, is it still sharing? Make sure. Yeah. Arise, my darling, my fair one, come away. Stav usually means fall. Here they translate as winter, but the, the, the rainy season has passed. Um, the uh, rains are over and gone. The blossoms have appeared in the land. The prime of pruning has come. Right? It's this new blossoming time. The Kastan of Turtle Dove, which is again often seen as very uh, Zionistic overtones in many of the Zionist literature. The figs fall on the fig tree, the vines and blossom give off fragrance. Arise, my darling, my fair one, come away. Okay, so it's a beautiful poetic line from the, um, from the book of Shir Hashirim. Um, you know, again, rife with poetry. And again, you, whenever you read poetry, you're like, okay, what does it mean? So I want to share with you the, uh, let's just see here. I lost my own uh, sharing option here. Um, sorry. There we go. Um, Okay, do you see this? Uh, you see the text again? Okay, so Rashi tries to explain what is this referring to? So Rashi says, Ana, right? Because it says, Ana Dodi, right? My villain says spoke, but Ana is a more powerful word for speaking. It says, Lashon Aniya, Lashon Tsaaka Kol Ram. It's like a screaming out loud. A screaming out loud. Where do we remember a people screaming? Where do we remember a people screaming in Jewish history? Well, remember Jewish history. Sorry, remember. Uh, yes, yeah, Suzanne, you're not muted. You can. Okay. Okay. Kol anot Exactly. Kol anot Right. The screaming out on the golden calf. But even earlier, there is the screaming. Yeah, Miriam, uh, you need to unmute. A second. I think you, I think you need to unmute Miriam so we can hear you. There we go. Um, was it in Noah? I would say both later. This Hakata. All right. Exactly. They used the word, the used the word Hakata Akata. Uh, I, I I hear they're screaming. Yes. But the refer the reference is Rashi is from the word Anna for the Jewish people who called out and screamed from their um, servitude in Egypt. Uh, um, so says Rashi that this is all a foreshadowing or a, a poetic reference <coughs> to the story of the Exodus from Egypt. That's what he says. So um, the Rabbi Yitzhak Zed Salvechik, this is where the Salvechik group comes and says a very powerful idea. We often find that there are mitzvot that are a commemoration of the Exodus from Egypt, right? What does it mean to commemorate something? We do this mitzvah to remind us of something that happened in the past. Listen to what he says though. But seemingly, it seems that the matter is, since there was an Exodus from Egypt, therefore we were commanded 
the mitzvah to commemorate the mitzvah, you have the mitzvah of commemorating the Esur Ishmiji. And this is the, what he says. Wow. Aval ha'emeti, but the truth is, lehefech. It's the opposite. Shem mipnei shem mitzvot elu tzrichim liot zecher litziat mitzrayim. Lachenu da'ya yitziat mitzrayim. Vahavein zo. Wow. He said, God had some big plan that we needed to have a Seder night. And we needed to have a uh, uh, Masa and Maror. And we need to have a Haggadah. Well, you can't have a Haggadah without a story to tell them that Haggadah. You can't have a Masa without a experience of being rushed out of Egypt. So you know what? God said, all right, no problem. I'll take them out of Egypt to create a framework for them to be able to do that mitzvah. Since there's a mitzvah of remembering the exodus of Egypt, which comes first, says Rav Salavechik, I'm therefore going to make an exodus from Egypt. Can you imagine that's a wild thesis? Wild. So he says that the concept of the arc of Jewish history was, as they say in Yiddish, a chetimtzeh a method, a means to achieve the mitzvot that were being planned. Now, that is a very, very, uh, again, a wild, uh, a wild thesis that he says. So again, I'll just read it again. Mipnei she mitzvot elu. Since these mitzvot, like the Haggadah and uh, pay, the Matzah and the Maror, need to commemorate Yitzhak Mitzrayim, lachain hu da'ya Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Therefore, there was an exodus from Egypt. Again, to me, a wild, wild thesis. Um, and um, he, he adds, um, and again, we'll skip some of these other sources. He quotes our Psukim, the verses from Shira Shira. Right? What does it say? That the, um, the Stav Avar, the winter, the rainy season has passed, the rains are over and gone. He says that this is a, a, um, a blueprint for history. The, sto- the, the text of the words in Shir Hashirim meant to serve as a blueprint. And that there's some sort of big tapestry of history that God needs to fill in the, 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 the boxes. Fill in the, the, the pieces. So it says, Kinea Stava, right? We know about, we always say, oh, Pesach must be in the in the in the springtime, right? That's why we have the um, the Ibur Hashanah, the changing of the year. So he says, the following. Kinea Stava Vara Geshem Khalaf, lower. It says that the rainy season is over. This time period has now passed of the rainy season. The Chodesh Aviv again, now it's springtime. Hanitzanim near Uva'aretz, right? That's the Pesach here. Hanitzanim near Uva'aretz, the blossom of appears on the land, right? Vayu Siman Ha'aviv, Yeshno Kvar, that it's now springtime. The Chodesh Aviv again. Ha'teina chanta pageha, ha'gfanim smadar v'anureach. The third sign of spring, which is, by the way, what talks about all these things. And then it continues. Arise, my darling, my fair one, come away. Which come away from where? Remember what Rashi says? Come away from Egypt. Says Rav Soloveitchik. Kevan disiman elu marim dechodesh aviv farigia. Since these Factors have shown that it's springtime. Harehi gies manech, let's say, mimitzrayim. Now it's time to leave Egypt. Again, mishum did din ha pesach that the concept, the laws of pesach, tarich liot bechodesh aviv, need to be in the springtime. Okay, now lech alakum, but let's say far. All right, so now the fact that the, the, the pieces are in place, so please, Jewish people, leave Egypt. Again, it's a powerful interpretation of those words in the Song of Songs. Basically saying, it's 
you know, the, the, you know, this factor is led to springtime. That factor is led for springtime. That factor is led for springtime. Okay, so that means it's time for Pesach. Now Jewish people leave Egypt so that there can be something to talk about on this Pesach thing. As if there is, from time immemorial, the concept of Pesach, it's just history's got to catch up to it and actually have an exodus from Egypt to fill in that Pesach with an experience. Again, we always think that Pesach comes because of the exodus from Egypt. Comes along with Solovitchik and says the exodus from Egypt comes because we have a mitzvah to keep Pesach. Now, that is, to me, a really wild, wild approach. Um, and that's how he explains this text in, uh, in, the, um, in, in the, the book of Shir Hashir. So that's what it says, his stakel be'oraita uvar alma. This is a famous adage in Jewish uh, tradition. His stakel be'oraita, God who looks inside the Torah, so to speak, uvar alma, and then creates the world. Meaning that the Torah predates the world. And so the things that happen in the world are simply reflections of what is uh, uh, laid out, so to speak, in this big picture of history in the Torah. Again, we believe that God is above time, so the linear concept of time in our mind is not the same as it works on a, on a celestial level, but it's still a very, very powerful and fascinating idea, uh, which is worth a lot of study and thinking about where this approach of Soloveitchik is. Go ahead, uh, Miriam. Go ahead. Uh, Rabbi? Yes. Um, I agree, it's a very interesting concept and kind of revolutionary, as you say. Yeah. Um, but it means the very last sentence of this last paragraph that I'm looking at mm -hmm. says, um, yeah, already, okay. already, so the word already, it's time to leave already as though it were in their hands as though it was in the slave's hands to leave already. In other words, it's up to you, get up and leave this, this horrible place that you're in physically and emotionally, this place. So what is happening parallel to this is the story of Pesach. What about the 10 plagues? That's when Pharaoh at last said to them, go out, leave you know, after his firstborn died. So therefore, what is Rabbi Soloveitchik telling me? What is he telling us? So I, again, again. Way, yeah, his, his uh, um, novel theory is that all of those aspects of the pieces of the narrative are not in the same timeline as we consider. And that that all played out as so that there should be a full and robust story that we would tell on the Pesach that we were required to do all the way from before the creation of the world. But you're 100 percent right. It's a it's a you know it's a, 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 a nuanced thing to which you have to look at all the pieces of the story. We couldn't have left before Paro, in fact, let us go. But that's just the sort of the playing out. It's as if you have a script of the play. And so you can't actually do these things until it gets to that point in the script. But the idea is that the original goal of getting the Jewish people to be on Har and I get to the Torah, that was already, the mitzvah was there and we just need to do all the things to get through to get to that mitzvah. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Am I muted? Because I don't see. Am I'm I sorry? muted? I don't see myself. Uh, we, because of the, the sharing, but we, we see you. So uh, the question, I have a question. Is the last sentence, the individual call to every Jew, is it the, the one who sees himself like he himself got out of Egypt and now go and do the work of Hashem? Beautiful. And I think that's actually, it's not what he writes, but I think it's what he means. That's beautiful. It's exact. And I think it goes to Boston, what Miriam was pointing out, which is that, that's exactly the point here. 
The point here is that we are meant to see history in this broad arc, and therefore, these narratives are narratives that are eternal and can apply to us in the way in which we apply them to our lives. Not just the literal leaving of this place called Egypt, because even that was part of this bigger picture narrative. It's so we leave those things that stop us and, uh, and hold us back and be able to express our kumilach, uh, uh, let's say, to take the, the shackles that stop us and then lead us and, and then take our own path to our destiny. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. So about uh, not being able to leave before Paro finally said, like, okay, you can go. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm now thinking of something that I hadn't thought before, which is you had people who were enslaved to someone who was a very, very strong leader who had his grip on literally everything that they did. And finally, when it got to the point where they realized within themselves, this guy isn't strong. This isn't the guy who is able to exert the force that he kept on saying that he had. And he was initially unquestioned in his control. And when he's shown to be weak, people finally are able to get out of that the clutches yeah, of, it's breaking out of that mentality not simply the breaking out of the physical shackles but yeah that they can it wasn't that they were allowed like okay get out of here but like they allow they were allowed within themselves to say why did i ever listen to this guy mm -hmm. by the way just to, to to bolster what i think a lot of people are saying specifically the point matt's making which is that it took time in that after they, and I've, I've shared this many times, I know the Ibn Ezra also that same, you know, points this out. After the Jewish people left Egypt, right? They had well over a couple million people and they were chased by what is potentially a minuscule army. It says 300, it's a Rechem Mitzrayim, but 300 chariots chased the 2 million people. Why was it that that scared them that they turned to God and says, oh no, we're scared, the Egyptians are chasing us. And I think Matt's point is that it took some time because they were so used to for so many centuries of when Egyptians said, stop, you said, stop, you stopped. And the Egyptians were calling after them and said, stop running away. And so they froze because exactly like you were saying, it was so ingrained in them to see the Egyptians as the those who exert power. And so part of this whole process was getting them away and breaking from that mentality that, that it shackled them. And it took a, took a time. It wasn't so simple. But I think that's exactly right. It wasn't about the gun or the whip that the taskmaster had in their hands. It was so much deeper than that. And what was able to happen was what stopping them was not some physical barrier that broke, you know, didn't let them walk away. There may or may not have been such a physical barrier was that mental sense of Pharaoh, Egyptians, they control everything about us and we can't do anything without their say so. And they were able to, you know, over time, break away from the shackles of, of that mentality. I think that's similar to some of the points that, that, that especially, you know, we were hearing from, from before. Um, but it takes this to a, an additional level when we see this as a narrative that goes in the opposite timeline that we thought, right? We think that there's this thing like this amazing miracle that happens. And because there's an amazing miracle that happens, we need to have a mitzvah called Pesach. And so I is saying the opposite. Because there's a mitzvah called Pesach, we need to have a pretty, pretty strong miracle to therefore make that a holiday make sense. Because all the, 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 the boxes have been checked of all of the, uh, you know, the signs of the time of the year. Okay, now it's time to leave Egypt because it's Pesach time, right? <laughs> the, the funny joke they say is when the, uh, when the Jewish people leave Egypt, they say, God, couldn't you wait until after Pesach to take us out of here? <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, 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 that's, that's the concept that, uh, you know, that, that's being expressed here, that somehow we have the ideas and then they express themselves in reality. Um, and so, yeah, Miriam. Um, Go ahead. Um, yes. Why? they stress the idea of Hagar. It says in the last paragraph, 
One more time. In the last paragraph, it says, "Vahayinu siman hashlishi dechodesh avi higia." Yeah. So has Pesach ever started for the advent of spring? Great question. Or is it always after spring? One question. The second one, why are they bringing spring into this? Is it Chakavid, the beginning of life, the beginning of new things, the beginning of growth, the beginning of a whole new world ahead of the Jews? on their way to the promised land. Um, I like the concept very much of bringing spring in with all its beauty, but why exactly? Yeah, so I would say that the way he's describing it is he's saying that Pesach is called and defined and set at Chag Aviv. And because it's set at Chag Aviv, once Aviv comes, therefore it's time to have Pesach. But I'll, I'll take it to the point that you were saying, which is, that we go to great lengths to ensure that Pesach is in the springtime. That's the whole reason why we always have leap years. The concept of a leap year is purely built around ensuring that Pesach is in the spring. Now think about it this way. Um, the spring is not a lunar concept, it's a solar concept, right? The spring is the four seasons of the solar year. Um, the Jewish holidays generally go based on the lunar year. So what we do is, again, the lunar year is, is uh, you know, approximately a month shorter um, than the solar year, a few, you know, a, 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 a fortnight, so to speak, shorter, right? So 354, there's 365, whatever the, the numbers are. So we add a month every couple of years to align the lunar holiday with the solar spring. We make sure that Pesach is in the spring and we build our entire calendar purely based on that notion. Um, and so that is a, a, a very powerful concept, you know, a very powerful idea, which is exactly that. We gerrymander the year just to get Pesach on the spring. And again, I think it goes to some of the points that Miriam was saying that, um, you know, has a, there's a lot of powerful symbolism connected to this concept of freedom that comes in, into spring. What Rav Salvechik is adding is when God made the blueprint of the world and he created the seasons and said at this particular season, there's got to be this mitzvah called Pesach so that when at that particular year, the all of the springtime uh, factors were in play. The, this, uh, you know, the, the, this about the trees and this about the, the rains, etc. Then it was therefore time for Pesach. It was appropriate. You know, that's the reason behind that being the time in which we had Pesach, because we, you know, get God had made this blueprint of the world to be able to fit in with the mitzvot that we are commanded as part of the initial. Uh, a tapestry called the Torah, called again his stakel right over our hour. Yes, uh, Susan. Uh, the it, the time of Passover is a, or, or Matan Torah is supposed to be our rebirth as the nation to start, start carrying out the mission that we, was given to Abraham. So that's why I think it's in the spring. It's not. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. I've never read called the video effect. It's too difficult for me. <laughs> I, it, does Soloveitchik see Shira Shirim as the concise idea of our theology? The great question about, you know, essentially what, what weight. Why we're here, what we're supposed to do and everything else. Right, so what weight do we give to some of these interpretations? So as Rosal Eji was very halachic oriented, which again, well, on one hand, is you know, waxing eloquent about Shira Shirim. On the other hand, it fits with his theology and philosophy because it's truly about a halacha. He's trying to say that there's this halacha, so we need to have all this stuff and all these technical requirements to get to that halacha. Um, but what, what path, so the way I think he sees 
the notion of Shira Shirim is that it is simply painting a picture that aligns with this overarching theology that connects to the expression of theology through halacha. I think to me, it's the consummate explanation, you know, the name of our year of inspiration through halacha. We look at all the halacha, we look at all things, and we must take inspiration from them to be able to then apply to our own lives. Um, and I think that, you know, is, is part of the answer to, to the question that you're raising. Um, so to me, one of the, the powerful ideas is that pace us an example of things, again, you can agree or disagree with some like point, but the concept of um, things being out of, uh, um, out of the linear timeline that we think they are, it's, a, it's just a more complex. And that to me often is, is, is a big part of that notion of freedom. The notion of freedom is looking at the world in a bigger picture where, you know, uh, uh, out, out, brief candle, right? Uh, um, you know, that where this poor player that struts and frets um, that we have this concept of we're part of a play. We're part of a big picture of a way that God has laid out the world. And that is not a contradiction to our freedom. It's in fact the foundation of it. The foundation of the way in which we express the freedom that we believe is a big part of it. And that's why this is sort of the freest time, Pesach. The concept of that rebirth, which is the concept that you were talking about, is a big part of the Pesach another philosophy. Thing, another theology. thing is it in order to be free, you have to deserve to be free. So do what you're supposed to do like a free yeah. person. Oh, yeah. Well, what are you, what are you going to say, Miriam? Seems like Susan and I are dominating, and I would rather not. I'd no, rather hear what I'd there. rather hear what other people say, but I'm not ready to leave Salvation yet. Okay. Because this occurs to me. He chose this very beautiful, romantic, physical relationship of a man and his bride of a man and a woman. He has the whole Tanakh in front of him. There are many relationships of God and his people. Mm -hmm. Oshea has a bit of a romantic one too. But I enjoy personally, it resonates with me that Rabbi Salabaychik chose Shir Hashirim this a uh, lovely, romantic, um, uh, spiritual, mystical, yet physical, all wrapped into one relationship of man and woman, a man and his bride, a man and his kala. And he sees that relationship as Israel and God. And therefore, it personally relates to me and I want to pat him on the back and <laughs> thank him because it's meaningful to me personally. And I just wanted to share that. That's great. No, and, and, and in fact, it's interesting because his whole thesis is that there's not this bifurcation between all the different parts of Tanakh that talk about things like the beauty and the poetry and the prakalacha. We're meant to infuse our observance of the experience of the Seder and the matzah and the maror with poetry and with meaning and with you know the concepts that we can relate to that inspire us, like that you were talking about these, these visions of relationships. And that's, I think, a big part of what we're meant to happen in the Pesach experience. The Pesach experience is meant to be chayav adam mitzrayim. Right? You had to see yourself as if you left Egypt, frankly, because leaving Egypt was only part of this whole plan for being able to have the Pesach experience. Um, because we bring all of these different things together and we're required to be emotionally invested in the observance of these, of these experiences, of these mitzvot. Um, which I think is, a, you know, again, a, a very powerful idea, again, as they say, the inspiration from Ram Um With that, I wanted to perhaps change uh, the, the format a little bit to talk about a couple of other examples of Hisaka of Oraito, of our Alma, of things that we see in the world that are part of our world today, 
and yet have roots in deep historical experiences. So I want to share with you um, something that you may have heard from me before, but there's something that always uh, fascinates me in my own uh, personal academic uh, life. Uh, let's see if I can get it here. Don't look at the left, at the right side. Don't look at the English yet. Only look at the Hebrew, please, if you can do that. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see, hopefully you can see me. All right, so again, uh, my, my request is that you only look at the, uh, the Hebrew right now. We'll get to the English later, okay? The law that the Torah gives us of having judges and police officers that are supposed to enforce justice in the Jewish world. Comes along Rashi. Rashi says, Shoftim Vishotrim, Shoftim, those are Dayanim Poskimetadim. Those are judges who follow the who, who, who meet out justice, who make the rules, uh, who, who, um, you know, who, who adju adjudicate cases. Shotri, what are the police? Who follow the command of the judges to tell people, you know, they enforce the law. That they uh, use whatever means necessary to enforce the command of the judge. That's Rashi's approach of what that pasuk means. Rashoda Ran Drashayirov, this is Rabbeinu Nisim. Rabbeinu Nisim says, uh-uh. Yadua Beinai. Beinai Pshada Katuv Kach. This is what the Torah means to say when it tells us we're supposed to have judges. Yaduahu. It is an own thing. Kiamin ha enoshi that the human condition, the human in Homo sapien, human beings, Sarich the Shofetchi is both bein pratam. They are not going to have a normal society unless they have some people with some level of authority. Because without that, remember the freedom discussion we had at the very beginning, if without any sort of administration, people are going to have anarchy. They're going to, you know, uh, take over each other. The whole world is going to go and be destroyed. For this, every nation needs medini. It's like a Hebrew word, a common Hebrew word, means, uh, you know, state-based administration. There was a very wise statement. Even the, uh, the, um, the band, the gang of thieves have a code of justice within the gang of thieves who are meant only to, to, to steal. You're not going to be able to function, even if you are the most immoral person, right? You're a gang of thieves whose job, is, who, you know, whose mission it is to go steal from people, but yet they have a code of justice within their group. The Jewish people need that like any other nation. Now, Jewish people, need an additional level of administration to guide and direct the provision of the, the uh, you know, the following of Jewish values. We know that there, you know, when there's a Jewish uh, legal system, there have the enforcement of Jewish law. Right, if somebody does an Avera, that has nothing, means nothing for the way the world works, but yet, it does mean something for the spiritual life of the people. So therefore, in every event that happens, you got to look at both sides. The functional way in which you have the uh, observance of the law, that you just have the world, and the way that you have the thought about the values that underlie the law. Um, so he therefore says that in most of Jewish ben adam law, you have two concepts. You have the idea that is meant to underlie the value that is meant to be expressed through the law, and then you have the enforcement of the law itself. That's shoftim mishotrim. You have those who interpret and engender the uh, uh, the ideas that go behind the law, 
that's separate and distinct from those who go and enforce the rules of the law. Take a look. Woodrow Wilson, the study of administration, political science quarterly, June 1887. Woodrow Wilson was known, by the way, the president of Princeton, and he's known now as the president of the United States and the start of the League of Nations, a big, uh, you know, a, a, a very consequential president. But before that, he was not known as a politician at all. His main, he was a very famous political theorist. He is known as the father of American public administration, Woodrow Wilson, separate and distinct from his role as the president of the United States. And so this is what he writes in the political science court. The field of administration is a field of business. It is removed from the hurry and strength. It at most points stands apart even from the debatable ground of constitutional study. It's a part of political life only as the methods of the counting house are part of the life of society only as machinery is part of the manufactured product. And so he lays down in this fair seminal article something he calls the politics administration dichotomy. Essentially saying that, as they say, never the twain shall meet, that the concept of the debates about theory and values and therefore lawmaking, what we'll call politics, without any negative connotation, that is meant to be separate and distinct from the administration of those laws. So this distinction is of high authority. The eminent journal writers insisted upon it as course. The famous writer Bloomsley, for example, bids a separate administration alike from politics and from law. Politics, he says, is state activity and things great and universal. While administration, on the other hand, is the activity of the state and individual and small things. Politics is thus the special province of the statesman. Administration of the technical official. Shoftim vishotrim. Policy does nothing without the aid of administration. But administration is not there for politics. And he says, this position, this discrimination between, two, between administration and politics is now happily too obvious to need further discussion. Okay, what is he saying here? He's saying that there's got to be multiple layers of the way a society functions. You have to have those who are deeply involved in the notion of the values and the ideas and the ideals, what it's called the tzedek, mishpat tzedek, and then you have the Shotri, what Rashi says, the difference between Rashi and Iran, Harodina Hamritz Batam. So here is a really interesting concept where you have deep Torah ideas that over the course of history end up expressing themselves in one way or another in the, the fundamental political theories that come to, the, uh, to be expressed in, um, in the world itself. And so it's a really, really interesting concept that the Torah lays out for us in terms of what the way interpersonal nature of relationships and society work with this concept of the shoftim, the the theory, the values, expression, and then the administration, the practical administration of Rashi says, and yet you end up seeing similar types of ideas expressing themselves in different political theorists over the course of history. So anyway, the, it's a separate idea from the concept of Pesach, but it's this idea of these eternal values. Behold or by the Lord, every generation express themselves in the lives that we have in the here and now. And so when we started talking about the notion of what freedom is, and we ended up with this run, this approach of Rabbeinu Nisim talking about how Freedom is not a contradiction to having administration and having politics. Without it, right, the katalistim, yesh benem hayosher, that there's a, there, there's a sense of justice and boundaries that needs to exist in every non-anarchist society, but yet there's these eternal values. And as we said in Pesach, this rebirth that is, allows us to happen in each generation. So may we all be zoche, and we all have the special privilege to have that sense of excitement and rebirth and reconnection and hopefully have a opportunity to be able to share in a new freedom of freedom from disease and freedom from 
uh, sorrow and difficulty and maybe be able to be Zoha to share only wonderful and happy uh, occasions together.